Have you ever wondered how you can, regardless of your age or experience, bring out the best parts of your experience to the work you do? That's what we'll talk about today. People who have worked with me say I'm innocent in action. They say I have the innocence and the unselfconsciousness of a child. Maybe I have. I still look at the world with uncontaminated wonder. Walt Disney. Last time we talked about the book, Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder by Chip Conley. And this book is really trying to put out the idea that regardless of what age you're at, Regardless of what experience you're at inside of a company, you have a role to play. If you are new at the company, you have fresh ideas and fresh learning. And if you're that elder in a company, you have experience and maybe some presence about you so that you can help others do better too. He really wants all of us to get together in the work world and be better together. We talked last time about the problem, about the fact that sometimes people look at each other with some kind of jealousy, some kind of feeling like the other generation is really taking our spot or trying to steal our spot in the work world, when instead we should be realizing that we all need each other. He said that basically we used to think of ourselves in the work world as three different careers. That starting out fresh, we had the middle of our career, and then we have the end of our careers. And even in the past, we had more manual labor jobs, maybe more factory jobs, where the technology didn't change all the time, where maybe you would even spend 40 years doing almost the same job that you did from day one. And now, with the way that technology is changing so rapidly, The work world is changing so rapidly. We all feel like it's just getting faster and faster. And that knowledge work requires a lot of experience, but a lot of new fresh thinking about how we do our jobs. And that we shouldn't get bored at it because there's always some kind of a new aspect to be with it. That a lot of the knowledge jobs that we have around us will give us the opportunity to work in those jobs and be valuable all the time. He likens our work career as being an appetizer, an entree, and a dessert, the beginning, the middle, and the end, and that we all have different thinkings at that particular time. But it's not that way all the time anymore. There may be positions where you have a lot of experience and you're very good at your job and you've been doing it for a very long time, And then a new technology comes in and shakes up the whole thing. I work for a software company that will go out and work with people in the medical field who've been great doctors, great nurses, great research coordinators, who've been fantastic at their job for 30, 40 years. And then suddenly someone like me comes in with brand new software and shakes their world up. And sometimes they feel great about it because it's something new, it's something better, it's something that's going to help them do their jobs better. Then other times people don't feel great about it at all because they think to themselves, wow, I was really good at being a research coordinator, but am I still going to be good at my job now that this new software is here that I don't feel so good about? And people get downright scared about new technology or new software coming into their workforce. I had worked with a woman who, she was really chipper during the day when I was showing her how the software worked and how it was going to make her life easier. But later she came to me and said, she's petrified. She doesn't get it. She's not good with software. And she's afraid as soon as her boss figures out she's terrible at this, she's going to basically be fired for someone who's younger, who feels more comfortable about software. And so I stayed after work at night, waiting basically until the rest of the office went home. And then the two of us sat at the office working on tutoring how to use the software. I showed her all the ins and outs. I showed her all the shortcuts. I went through some real 
examples with her. I helped her get the first couple of budgets put into the system. And suddenly she started getting it. It wasn't that it was that hard. She just felt this was beyond her. But once we started working on it together, she started to realize that her job is safe, that she'll figure this out. And she always knows where to find me if she needed more help. But people get scared about new things, particularly when they got good at the old things. Meanwhile, you get new people in a company who are full of fresh ideas and exciting new challenges. And sometimes they run over people who have been doing things for a very long time without really asking the question, why? Why are we doing it this way? Why aren't we doing it this other way? Why are we doing it in Excel when we could be using the software? It's this constant conflict of new versus old, innovative versus the old tried and true system, and basically both the young people and the older people feeling scared about their longevity in a particular job. He gives this quote from a fellow named Paul Bennett, who he says is a baby boomer and was a creative chief officer at a company called IDEO. And he said, quote, life has historically been viewed as a mountain. The first half of your life, you're climbing, attempting to be all you can be. And then the second half of your life, you're descending, realizing all the things you won't be. Which I think is a crazy way of looking at the work world. The whole process of work is a journey. It's about the ups and downs, the things we're good at, the things we're not good at. and. It's always very hard. I told a story a couple podcasts ago about how there was a person who was new in the company and her first day in the office, she basically had all these ideas about how this old system we were doing was completely wrong. She never even bothered to check that I was the person who developed it. And she decided that she was going to rewrite the way we did things. And then after she got her new system, her new plan in place, someone came in on her first day and did the exact same thing to her. And the problem is, is both of us, is that we got stuck in our ways. We did something a few years ago and we were pretty happy with it and we put a lot of work into it. And so we weren't looking for someone new to come into the company and shake it all up. But the answer really is that it needed shaking up. And that fresh idea did in fact make it better. I had to admit when I looked at what I had, she, of course, did better because she was taking it from her experience, from what was built already, and she made it better. Could I get all burned up about it? Sure. Could she get all burned up when it happened to her? Sure. But the truth of it is these new ideas made it better. But then the question is, is what can you do so that you can come into a company as a newer person with all sorts of fantastic ideas and not really burn down all your bridges that way. And that's really accomplished by learning. Ask why. Find out how it's been done. Find out how we got there or why it was done in a particular way. And ask lots of great questions. Then, when you understand the situation, the goals, what had been tried, what hadn't worked, what worked, now you can take an informed decision and all that fresh idea and energy that you have and make a contribution that doesn't make the other person feel bad. But then on the other side of things, if you've been that person who developed the old system, you have to have a little bit of hubris to realize that not everything you do is perfect, that certainly fresh ideas can come in and make things better. And your goal is is to make things better for customers. And if we have that fresh perspective and we give people that chance to improve things without us feeling all angry about it will actually make things better. He suggests that there's basically the three phases of life that we talked about. And we talked about the going up the mountain and down the mountain. He also says that sometimes it's called learn, earn, and retire, meaning we learn at the beginning of our career. We then sit back and earn all the money in the middle of our career, and then eventually we retire. But now in our modern work world, it's not like that anymore. We're in a time where I see company after company after company being unable to fill the roles that are important to them. 
unable to do some of the projects they hope to do because they can't get the right staff in place. People who are begging employees to come in, trying to convince them to come in, offering all sorts of benefits now like working from home or other types of interesting ideas because we can't fill those roles. And so now we're in the spot where it's not learn, earn, and retire. It's learn, earn, learn, earn, and we're going back and forth. If we knew our job before, there's going to be new stuff, new software, new ideas, and we're going to have to learn it all over again. If we're feeling pretty satisfied with our jobs and our positions and the things we're doing, that means that we're not learning anymore, that we're not taking new ideas, and that we should be continually learning, continually going back and bringing in the best ideas from everybody. And that we have to stop thinking that even when we're younger people or we're older people or we're just middle people who have a lot of experience, that we're neither losing our value and that we no longer have any relevance to the company or that we're so amazing nobody should offer us any sort of advice. I remember that I used to work with someone and it was interesting because she did a job in the company for a really long time. And I think she got bored with the position. She felt like she wanted to do something else, something that was more involved and something that actually had to do with the role our company played in the marketplace. She got this other position and she didn't really want to spend a lot of time learning that new position. She felt like she had a lot of experience. She knew a lot of things and that she would be able to come in and just take her place in that job and just run with it. But then she got bored with that position too. And so then she wanted a different job that was entirely different, but she didn't really put the work in in the same way that I thought she might have. And at some point, she basically came up with ways of, well, I don't want to do that job anymore. And I, and I don't want to do this job anymore. And I don't want to do this job anymore. And at some point, when you're a small company, if you say you won't do something anymore, eventually you're going to run out of roles. And she ended up leaving the company because she just basically refused to do any of the roles anymore because she knew better. She was sick of it. She was tired of it. She already knew how to do that. And it wasn't something that she was willing to take and learn from or ask good questions or figure out ways of making a better process. That, I think, is the problem in general with aging. It's not so much that you can't learn something. It's that you maybe get to this point where you just refuse to learn anything. You feel like you've put in your miles. You've done the important things that you needed to do. And now your viewpoint, what you know, is impeccable. Lose that ability to not just be the mentor but also be the intern where you ask great questions and let other people help make a better product, you're going to find out that you're going to be in that same position where there's just no more roles for you. You have to never give up that learning position, that place where you can be questioned, that place where you can ask questions. And if you can keep that mindset in place, you will always have something that will allow you to become new again, allow you to have changing roles, and allow you to grow inside of whatever company you're in. He gives us an example of someone who was working at Harvard Business School who had done amazing things. She worked at Johns Hopkins, World Bank, really qualified and an amazing human being. But after a while, she started to feel like she was invisible and that no one really saw her anymore. What she learned is that she was able to do a reset of her career by resetting her mind and her expectations. She was able to then take all of her knowledge and all the things that she learned in the work world and give it a new life by basically evolving along with her job, along with the world, and allowing basically the world to see you're not perfect. You don't have all the ideas, 
but that you're able to create what she called this resilient circles in her midlife career. And so again, if you're not willing to grow or have that mindset of growing, you're going to become stagnant. You're going to not be able to learn or grow inside the job. And you're going to be like that person I used to work with who was so inflexible, she just refused to work at anything, really be a part of anything, or gain new mastery in a new area in the company. I think that was a lesson to me to realize you never want to do that. You never want to be the person who refuses to grow and refuses to learn because at some point you'll be refused a future. And he said when he looked at different types of studies that were out there, particularly one by Zenger and Folkman, they found out that there was a direct correlation with self-confidence and aging, more so women than men. And then at some point, men did start to feel less confident. I think it's because they may be feeling like they lost a step. They may be seeing the younger worker, the one with all the fresh ideas, the one who has all the energy to work all the hours, breathing down their necks, and that makes them feel less confident. Well, I think women start to gain their own feet. You know, they've been in the work world a long while, and they start to feel this mastery. I know for myself, I'm not a fake it till you make it kind of person. I was told that by someone in a company once that the reason he felt that I wasn't getting ahead at that time in the company was because I admit when I don't know something. (laughs) That was just mind blowing to me. So if someone comes to me and says, hey, Jill, do you know how to configure these widgets and get them out to our customer? I would say, well, no, I don't really know anything about those widgets, but if you have any sort of a PDF or a manual, I'm happy to read it and look at it and see if I can figure it out. It's not a very confident answer. And so if there's a promotion involved with these widgets, who are they going to give it to? The person who just says, oh yeah, I know how those widgets work. I can do it. Essentially lying about it, but going through that same process of reading the manual but they just said a different answer than what I said. I think a lot of times the fake it till you make it people feel confident early on and then they start to lose that confidence when there's people behind them younger than them who are better at it. Meanwhile, people who aren't fake it until you make it individuals start to gain confidence because they actually learn so much more that they actually gain genuine confidence in their abilities because they've learned better. It was funny because the same individual was talking to me and he said, you know, you were so confident during your job interview, but now when I ask you questions about certain tasks, you don't come off as very confident. And I said, well, a job interview is about me and my experience, and I know me and my experiences very well. But if you ask me if I know about this widget, I've never encountered before, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you I know how it works. And so I never felt that genuine confidence was about being boastful about something I didn't know. I felt that genuine confidence is about being honest about your ability to learn something. And I think we just saw it in different ways because he was definitely a fake it till you make it kind of person. So Chip Connolly says that we have to make sure that we build bridges with everyone around us. Collaborative bridges, he calls them. So we have bridges to people who are vice presidents and CEOs and high up in the leadership, but also people who are new to the company, people who are part of different teams. We have to learn how to meet all sorts of different people inside of our careers. And I think if you work in a company that's now working from home, that's going to be harder than ever but it's worth putting in that effort to make sure you do it. He says that you should be humane and humorous, which means that you are funny, that you're good to be with, that people like to be around you. He says we should have curiosity and calmness about us, that that's going to give us that gravitas where people trust us. We slow down, we focus, we don't 
put people in a panic by not rushing. We see all the ins and outs and catch on to the different parts that are really going to be problems in the company and learn how to solve them because we're taking a very calm approach. He also says that we have to be present, which means that we have to be involved in the company and not off somewhere else, that we're not brushing people off, that we're not missing meetings, that we're not involved in things in the company, but that we have a big presence in the company as a solid individual. So he gives some questions about what he calls the mod L, right? The modern elder and how we can evolve our own identities inside the company. And he says the first thing is to get an identity cleanse, which means maybe it's time to rethink who we are in the company. If we've been arrogant in the past, if we felt like we haven't needed to learn things, maybe we have to really take a look at who we are and how people in the company see us and see if we could do better. He says then we can redefine our reputation. Maybe if you have a reputation as someone who doesn't ask questions, who brushes off new people, who doesn't give other people the time of day, maybe you don't like new ideas and you don't listen to other people, maybe this is the time to really change that. He gives the quote from Gandhi who said, your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, and your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values, and your values become your destiny. So in the end, all those things, our beliefs, our words, our values, our habits, all make up who we are. And so maybe it's time to really change that up. Then he says, We should take all the things that we learned, all our experiences and our things that we value about our experience in the workplace and start to ask questions, become the intern and really try to ask the really good basic questions. A lot of this comes in with the quote at the beginning of the last episode where it's Robert De Niro in the movie, The Intern. And if you haven't seen it, it's a fantastic movie, but it's basically about an older guy who used to be in charge of a company down on his luck. You know, he got laid off at some point for a newer, younger guy, and he decided to take the position of an intern under Anne Hathaway. And he would ask good questions. And at the same time, he learned from her. She also learned from him. And that relationship benefited each other. So it's a question about how we could work together to become better together. And that if we're willing to learn this beginner's mindset and start with fresh perspective and learn about how things can be done a little bit better, then we'll start asking these why questions. Why are things the way they are? Why do we have this method that we always do? We can go on asking all these questions, but it's about breaking down the very thoughts we've had for a long time, becoming curious, becoming an agent for change, and using questions not to beat people up with, but instead to genuinely learn about new ways of doing things or breaking down old problems to see if there's something that we could be doing better. And he says that sometimes we can't ask questions. There are deadlines and things have to get going. Every time that we can start breaking down things that are going on in our job and our culture and learn about them better, we'll be able to do more for our company. He says that we can foster candor, which means being truthful, but that doesn't mean being rude. We can better align are questioning with the goals of the company, and we can make sure that leadership is actively engaged in the process. And this kind of got me interested in it because I'll tell you that a lot of times what I do is because I know a lot of the senior leadership in my company because I've worked with them for so long that I try to be an advocate for when they need to get involved with something, I'll say something. 
I'll let them know that something has to happen so that they can put their energy and the resources into solving a major problem. Using those connections of knowing people inside your company because you are experienced and you've been there for a while and making the company better with your connections. He says that what we have to really do is have what he calls the humble inquiry. And that comes from a fellow named Edgar Schein and said, it is the highest ranking leaders who must learn the art of humble inquiry as a first step in creating a climate of openness. The art of questioning becomes more difficult as status increases. Meaning as we get higher up in the company, sometimes it becomes harder for us to ask questions and find things out, either because we already have an opinion about how this answer should come. We already have viewpoints about how it should go. And maybe people are even less frank with us about the questions we ask them because we are in a higher position in leadership. And if we can learn that humility in asking questions, instead of using questions to beat people over the head with that, we'll be better as leaders even. Think about the boss who will say, so do you know how you could have done better in that last task? And you know that they're not asking you a question because they have a genuine interest in what's going on. They have a question because they want you to confess to basically doing something wrong. As a leader in a company or an elder in a company, you have to get away from using questions as a hammer and really learn how to get to that very humble question. You can start your questions with, could you explain a little bit further? Can you help me understand? How do you feel about? Because when leader asks some questions about how they feel, the employee or the newer person feels like that person is really trying to learn something about the way that the company is. And then the important thing is to listen, to brainstorm on the ideas that you heard, to collaborate with the new people you met, and mentor each other. Be a counselor to other people in your company. I always felt like I was Aunt Jill in my company. I was the person people came to when they got worried about something that was going on. Then I could talk to leadership about concerns people were having, not breaking the trust of the person who came to me, but letting leadership know that there's some worries out there. And I'm able to help people, leadership, and newer employees feel more comfortable in the position. In the end, you should be mutual mentors. You can help mentor newer people in your company, and you can help them mentor you with their fresh ideas, their new ideas, the way that they learn things, and whatever experience they've had. So my challenge to you is think of three ways that you could be a mentor. What are some ways that you can help newer people in the company do better and reach their potential? Then think of three ways that you could be an intern. How could you learn more? How could you ask better questions? What are some questions you could ask that will bring new and creative ideas to the problem? All right, everyone, thanks so much. Again, if you have any questions, please email me at jill at smallstepspod.com. And remember that you can be a mentor and an intern at the same time by taking small steps. <laughs>